Hi there, guys. Welcome back to the next set of episodes for Chem Complete. And in this series, we are going to continue the Organic 2 lecture, and we have NMR coming up next. So NMR stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, and it is a type of spectroscopy that we are going to examine. So we have IR, uh, which uses infrared to vibrate molecules. We have MS, which is mass spec. We're basically hitting a compound with electron beams at that point in order to cleave certain fragments. MS is good for telling us the molecular weight of the structure we're examining. But by a large, large, far stretch, NMR is considered to be the most useful of all the spectroscopy techniques because NMR allows us to actually go in and determine the skeletal structure of the carbon hydrogen makeup for the organic compound of interest. So we're going to get some practice in for these lessons where we are solving some unknowns. I'm going to put unknowns up and we're going to try to solve them. Uh, the first thing I'm going to lead off with is a understanding and understanding of how NMR works. And there are lots of different potential NMRs. The two NMR techniques that we focus on most in organic chemistry is H1 NMR, and that is for protons, and the C13 NMR, which obviously deals with carbon. And those are both very important NMRs. These are not the only NMRs. There are lots of different NMRs that you can do. But the key, whenever you're doing an NMR, is that the nuclei for whatever atom you're interested in hydrogen carbon etc they have to have a spin okay so the nuclei must have a and we're gonna put here a magnetic spin so what do I mean by this well hopefully you remember when we talked about electrons back in general chemistry they had a spin associated with them right so they could be spin up or they could be spin down in terms of their magnetic association well nuclei some nuclei are the same way and protons meaning hydrogens here okay uh, when I use that term proton because we have to remember when I do talk about hydrogen if hydrogen is H plus then we're really just talking about a proton right because hydrogen is one proton there's a plus in the middle of that that's in the nucleus or that makes up the nucleus and then there's one electron circulating that proton so you take away the electron and put the plus charge in and all you have is a proton all right so just be aware of what I'm talking about when I use these these terms so when you come in and you take a look at a hydrogen nucleus you have the proton in there, and hydrogen nucleus has a spin associated with it, a magnetic spin. So whenever I look at the hydrogen nucleus, okay, it could be spin up. All right. Now what really happens is you have these sort of these side magnetic fields, right, that are flowing around the nucleus. However, we're just showing this as spin up or I could have spin down for the nucleus. Now, whenever I have a compound, right, so let's just take a very uh, simple compound. Let's say CH3, CH2OH, which is ethanol. All right, these three hydrogens here would each have their own nuclei. These two hydrogens here would have their own nuclei, and this individual hydrogen would have its nuclei. So when you think about, okay, if I take a sample of ethanol, there's going to be billions upon billions upon billions of ethanol molecules. That's even an understatement when you think about Avogadro's number, right? But there's going to be a lot of ethanol molecules that are present in my sample. And so what ends up happening from a uh, nuclei standpoint is that these nuclei are going to be all over the place, right? So when you're looking at this, they're going to be oriented in all sorts of different directions in the solution when this is occurring. Now, what the concept or the idea of NMR is, 
is that NMRs are these big giant instruments that are going to apply a large external magnetic field, right? So I'm going to draw this giant arrow, and this is the magnetic field that we have here. Most of the time in physics, okay, we represent this as B naught or B O, small o. And so this is the magnetic field, the external magnetic field that is produced by the NMR. So this is being put forth by the NMR. NMRs are these giant magnets. You have to be careful how close you're standing to them if you have any sort of metal objects or credit cards that could get erased or things like that. So these super magnets are generating a large magnetic field. And when I put my sample, my NMR sample, into this instrument, the protons, okay, because we're at for right now, I'm talking about H1 NMR, but the, the nuclei within those protons are all going to align themselves. And so some of them are going to align with the magnetic field. And then some of them are going to align themselves against the magnetic field like this, spin up or spin down. Now, one of the things that we want to consider here, okay, along this axis is that I have energy, which I'm going to represent with E. So I am increasing in energy as I continue to climb up as far as the distance in this magnetic field. So here's what's going on, right? I have nuclei that are aligned with the magnetic field, and I have nuclei that are aligned against the magnetic field, right? So this would be considered, a lot of people will call this alpha, but this is the spin up state for the nuclei and then beta would be the spin down state for the nuclei and so what's going to happen is these will randomly arrange themselves in between these two levels however I'm going to find that more nuclei are in the lower spin state and there's going to be fewer nuclei that are found in this upper spin state now, if you think about that, that makes sense because this is going to be considered lower energy if I'm in this spin-up state, and this is going to be higher energy if I'm in the spin-down state. Now, why is that the case? Well, each of these little nuclei is its own magnet, and so what's happening here is that as each of these are found in a spin-up state, they are basically going along with the magnetic field. They're aligned with the magnetic field. So think of the large magnetic field sort of as a stream, right? And it's easier to swim with the current, to go with the stream, than to go against the stream. And so these guys that are spin down in this higher energy level, we know from a chemical perspective and an energy perspective that to be higher energy means less stability. But why is this higher energy? Because we're going against this incredibly strong external applied magnetic field from the NMR and so that puts these in a higher energy state. It's not as preferable for a spin down nuclei to be uh, up there for an extended period of time in comparison to the lower energy state. So that's great. What's What do we do here in terms of the NMR? Well, the whole goal between NMR is to take advantage of this energy difference, right? So I have a difference in energy between the low spin state or the spin up state and the high energy spin state, the spin down state. And so what NMR does is after I align these nuclei in this magnetic field, I'm going to send in radio waves. Okay, now radio waves are pretty low on the electromagnetic spectrum, but there's still a range of radio, wa radio waves that we can hit this sample with. And so the idea here is to cause the resonance, which is what, what comes from the, uh, the R part of NMR. We want to send in the radio waves so that we can, at a specific radio frequency, hit this resonance. And we'll cause the spin-up states to switch or to hit a spin-down state, right? So what's going to end up happening? Well, I have my external magnetic field. I've got a spin-up, right? And then... Here's the spin down state. So this is the alpha and the beta. And we'll just mention here again, this is our B naught. And so the goal here 
is that when I send in the proper radio wave, right, that's coming in, this is energy, you can really associate this with frequency, because when we're talking about the energy of waves, we talk about frequency, right? So as the proper frequency hits this, it's going to have enough energy to essentially excite or to promote this nuclei over to the spin up state. I'm sorry, the spin down state, the higher energy state, right? So with the right amount of energy at the right frequency, I can promote this up here temporarily. Well, what naturally is going to occur, what wants to happen, just like when you excite an electron up to a higher energy level or a higher shell, this is going to look to come back down and occupy its original alpha spin up state. And so as it does that, it gives energy back off because the energy that's absorbed here needs to be returned or sent back out as this nuclei attempts to return to its spin up state. And so what's going to occur is when this energy is released, it's going to hit the detector. Right? So the NMR has a detector and it can detect the frequency from these wavelengths. Now, we do or we utilize most of the time in organic chemistry what's called FT NMR. You may have heard this with IR and other things. The Fourier transform all right, is going to basically take sinusoidal waves and convert them into the time transformation that we're going to have where we see these individual peaks, if you've ever seen an NMR, instead of large sine waves. Um, and so we do deal with FT NMR. Usually the FT gets left off of that a lot of times. We just refer to NMR when we're doing this. But what's going to end up happening is we the energy is going to come out. It's going to hit the detector. And that detector will say, okay, I realize that a certain frequency was just sent, all right? So down here, and we're going to talk about what this means a little later, is frequency. Normally, you're going to see PPM, which is parts per million. So anytime I have the NMR field, the large NMR field, it's in megahertz, okay? We do not need megahertz worth of frequency or worth of energy when we're talking about these types of energy jumps. They're going to be very small in comparison. And so we're dealing on the order of hertz, not megahertz, which would be mega is a million when we're talking about that prefix. So the PPM is a, it's sort of a way of normalizing the frequency depending on the magnetic strength of your NMR. So, you know, some people, a lot of undergraduate institutions will use 200 megahertz NMR. And then I could use a 400 megahertz NMR. Well, when I use a 400 megahertz NMR, I'm saying that I'm creating a stronger magnetic field. And so the energy jump is going to be different in a 400 megahertz versus a 200 megahertz. The, the ma external magnetic field will affect the gap between these two. And so PPM is a way of saying, look, no matter what frequency I'm using, let's use a standardized scale uh, so that basically I don't take one NMR and I see something showing up at a frequency of 10 hertz and then I put it in a different NMR and it's showing up at 30 hertz because the NMR field is larger. The PPM helps to normalize that, which is basically the difference in the, the frequency jumps relative to the NMR itself. Okay, that's not something you have to be too concerned with, um, but I'd be happy to answer questions about that if you if you have additional questions. And so over here, I'm just going to put an I, but this is a intensity or abundance. Uh, so what you'll end up seeing is all of these peaks, right, that show up on the NMR. They all have different meaning to them. But whenever I see a set of peaks or what we would call a signal, that is a result of a set of protons that have given off a specific frequency as they relax back down to their spin up state. Okay, so where these particular signals lie, which we call chemical shift with the PPM, we have to have a little bit of a better understanding as to um, an effect called shielding and deshielding of the nuclei. Because as the nuclei are shielded or deshielded, they're going to feel different effects from the magnetic field, and therefore they're going to have smaller or larger jumps. And that's why I don't just see one signal in an NMR. When I see, uh, or at least when I, I have a 
several sets of different nuclei that are all unique from one another, I get multiple signals in the NMR because they all have different shielding and deshielding effects. They all have different effects in their interaction with the magnetic field. And so therefore I get different signals, okay? The theory behind this, I can understand if it's the first time you're exposed to this, this can be a little difficult to understand. Um, the, the more important part, and I don't want to sort of belittle the understanding of how an NMR works, um, but if you were interested in studying this, you could take like a graduate level course. The real key here is going to be how to read and interpret these NMR spectra. So in other words, when I get an NMR spectrum, can I read it and actually make sense of it? That's the key when you're in undergrad, okay? Understanding why certain things are shifted the way they are, what it means, and can I get an unknown structure uh, to match up with what I see, or can I take a known structure and predict approximately what I should see on the NMR? So I think that's going to wrap up the intro to how NMR works. And the next major topic we're going to talk about is shielding and deshielding, because that's going to tell us, okay, for every set of unique nuclei, why are these signals showing up here, right, versus here, versus maybe somewhere down here I get another signal. The chemical shift, the PPM, or the frequency, and why I see different frequencies, that's explained by shielding and deshielding. So we're going to go through shielding and deshielding in the next lesson. I hope this was helpful in terms of background and understanding how NMR works. If you have any questions, you are welcome to leave me a comment, and I'm happy to get back to you. Um, other than that, if you enjoyed this and you want to support the channel, please remember to like the video if you found it helpful. Subscribe, because I will definitely be putting up new material on a regular basis, and that will be the quickest way for you to know that there's more material up. So until the next time, I will see you guys then, and thank you so much for supporting my channel. See you later, guys.